My guest was a world-renowned motivational speaker who knew all the secrets of success. Then he lost it all. Next on this edition of It's Supernatural. Centuries have come and gone, offering wisdom and understanding throughout the ages. Today, there should be nothing beyond one's power to discover. And yet, the strange, unusual, and mysterious world of the supernatural defies understanding. Stay tuned for a unique and powerful investigation into a curious, undiscovered universe only on It's Supernatural. Sid Roth, your investigative reporter. My guest spent most of his life in yeshivas, rabbinical schools, even in Israel. And he, he really, from all external purposes and, and appearances, had it made. What do I mean by that? Peter Hirsch, you were a motivational speaker. You uh, spoke in front of tens, twenties, thousands, 80,000 80, people. What's it feel like? to be a motivational speaker in front of 80,000 people? Well, what does it feel like? At first, it's terrifying, but then it's great. <laughs> and, it's, and the thing for me why it was so great is because I did it all on my own, of course. You know, uh, I didn't give anybody else credit, and I'd accomplished absolutely everything on my own. What did you accomplish? So, well, I went to law school. That's something I don't even know if you knew. If you knew. I graduated law school, the top of my class, went to the number one law firm in the world in New York City, practiced for two years, realized I hated it because I became a lawyer for the wrong reasons. I became a lawyer because I didn't want to be a doctor. You know, growing <laughs> up Jewish in Long Island, there aren't too many choices. Well, why didn't you become a rabbi? Yeah, that's a good question because that was really expected of me and I studied mm. in yeshivas here and just intense Jewish learning in the United States and in Israel and I have no idea till this day what held me back. I have no idea why I didn't just take the few tests that would have been required. Uh, how much were you making a, a, a month? Oh, Is that too personal? No, but. please. At the, at the peak, it was uh, not too long ago, just between fifty dollars and $60,000 a month. And what was your lifestyle like? Lifestyle was good. Tell me about you know, it. And it's, it's interesting. Provoke me to jealousy. <laughs> yeah, because you know, a lot of people say, well, I was rich, but I was empty. I didn't feel empty. Okay, mm -hmm. that was not an issue with me. Uh, since I had left orthodoxy, really, and, and become more of my own person, thinking I could accomplish anything on my own, well, I met a wonderful woman. Thank God I met this woman. She's just an angel in every way. And uh, she was living on the beach in, in Hawaii. So rather than me take her to New York, I thought it would be smarter for her to take me to Hawaii. <laughs> So we were living... Good and, thinking. Yeah, and for me it didn't matter because I would just travel. It didn't matter where I lived. I spoke a few times a month. And uh, the rest of the month we would sit in our uh, beautiful home. And so you get a picture of the home. My office was in my home, which overlooked the deck. And the deck was about 90 feet long, which overlooked the ocean and the mountains of Kauai. Now, now Peter, why did you become a motivational speaker? Why didn't you, with the, the law degree and the abilities you have, just... Just start your own company, and uh, why a motivational speaker? Why did you do it? Again, another great question. It was, uh, more than anything, I know that, that I can touch people. And I always had that feeling that through, I, I can move people to action. Plus, I think a major reason at the time was ego-driven. Ego-driven. You know, to get in front of that crowd and get the standing ovation and get the letters, ah. Oh, said it felt so good. Did you feel that you had like the Midas touch, that anything you touched would prosper, that you could never fail? That was exactly it. And that was the reality for most of my life. Whatever venture I test, whatever I went into, just blossomed. Financially, it was beautiful. So you really beautiful. believed what you were teaching. Oh, there's no question. Yeah. I believed completely that whatever we want, our minds have the power to take us there. Uh, yes, but for, uh, coming from an Orthodox Jewish background, from yeshiva training, right. uh, where did God fit in with your presentation of, uh, of motivation? That's a good question also. I think God at the time to me was more of a, I, I always believed in God, but it was sort of like God's within. Do you know what I mean? We have the power to do what God does. 
Did you almost gonna, feel like you were a little god? I think that's tell, exactly, tell me the truth. Yeah, I think that's exactly how I felt. That not just me though, mm -hmm. not just me. That all of us had the. Uh, even saying those words now hurt me. What but did all you say? Of us have the god potential. You know, the potential to be gods, do whatever we want, accomplish whatever we want. So your your, your marriage was going good. Oh, everything was going great. There was nothing, there, you know, it's not like I could point to my life mm -hmm. and say, well, here were some holes. I didn't feel the holes at the time. Now, looking back, the reality, did I have peace? Well, no, I didn't really have peace. I was just always on energy. I was always running. Would you almost say that you were deceiving yourself? There's no question that I was deceiving myself. There's no question. And the only reason I know it is because I see myself now. Do but you that's know? deception, you know, you're the last one to know. Of course. Okay, so one My day. My wife knew it clearly. Yeah, but so one day you come home <laughs> and uh, your wife makes a, a very simple statement yeah. about your wonderful lifestyle. What was it? Picture the scene. We're okay. sitting on the beach at sunset, holding hands. And she says, sweetie, we're so blessed. All, God's just blessing us in such, so many ways. You really need to thank Jesus for all we have. So, <laughs> I beg your pardon. Excuse me. Now I remember my words so clearly because I, I, I mean these were the exact words, sweetheart, with anger, you know, <laughs> with intensity. Sweetheart, not only shouldn't you thank Jesus, but you should thank me, because I'm the one who worked my butt off for all of this. Now, my wife's very smart, very smart woman, very loving. She just said, OK, smiled, and took five steps back to avoid the lightning. Well, when came. you heard, thank Jesus, what really went on inside of you? Oh, to me, understand, even though I had left Orthodox Judaism, there's that concept called the pintle yid. Do you know that Jewish spark that never leaves and will never leave. I, I was born, I will die a committed Jew. The concept of, I, and I, I knew my wife had always believed in Jesus. Why, she, why did you even marry a non-Jew? Because, you know, I had left it at that point and it was all, it was okay because we were, the God was within us. But still, when I heard Jesus. Her statement was? You need to thank Jesus. It wasn't just, I'm thanking Jesus. I, could, I knew she did, that was her thing. But now when she's telling me I need to, whoa, that doesn't work. Whoa. Guess what? God heard that statement. Guess what? Well, come on back in a moment and we'll tell you what. Be right back after this. Hello YouTube, Mishpocha. Mishpocha is a Hebrew word, it means family. This is Sid Roth. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. If you've been blessed by this show, please subscribe. Then click the bell so you won't miss a single episode of It's Supernatural. Hello, I'm Sid Roth, your investigative reporter. My guest, Peter Hirsch, trained in rabbinical schools, his whole life yeshivas, even in Israel, became a motivational speaker. 80,000 people would hear him at once, making forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a month, living in Hawaii, beautiful wife, everything going good. And one day, his wife says, you know, sweetie, you should thank Jesus for all of our wonderful blessings. And he went through the roof. He says, don't thank Jesus, thank me. What happened next, Peter Hirsch? Well, next is when uh, God really allowed the lightning to strike. I'm not going to ever say God did it. I'm going to say he just allowed it to what happen. What happened? Against, I won't say against my better judgment, but without doing my own due diligence, I accepted a position in Dallas moving the family from Hawaii to Dallas. It was this five-year-old company. How was, could you go from Hawaii to, I've been to your, your city, Dallas. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question it's a different, in itself. That's one why, I still don't have you? an answer for. But, but, well, really. but why did you take this job even? Well, it was, looking back, it was greed. 
Wh Why? What did they tell I, you? How I rationalized it. What did, what did it they tell you? That it was this five-year-old company that was being purchased by new owners. They were taking it public, turning it into a dot-com, and I was going to be able to retire with more money than my grandchildren needed. Mm. I was only 32. So that was an exciting prospect. I didn't do my own diligence, my own due diligence as a lawyer. No one to blame but myself. Well, I'm there at this company 100 days or so, and I realize it's not kosher. These new owners are definitely doing things that they shouldn't be doing. It's not kosher. I leave. I'm there 100 days, my integrity intact. Mm -hmm. I leave. Big deal. Big deal. Very big deal. The Federal Trade Commission of the United States of America comes in, sues the old guys, some new guys, and scoops me up in their net. But you're a positive thinker. Uh, <laughs> thank me, not thank Jesus, you said. Absolutely. So you can handle this. Well, that's exactly what I thought. And I was like, this is no problem, because I preached all around the world self-responsibility. Whatever mess you're in, you created it. Whatever good things have happened to you, you created it. This was going to be a piece of cake for me because I didn't do anything wrong after all. Had I done something wrong, I'm man enough to take responsibility. Well, I didn't do anything, and there was no way out of it. Now I'll fast forward a little. It's months, it's turning into years now, I mean almost a year, where you can imagine the legal costs alone. We now have no home on Kauai, and we've moved from a five bedroom home on Kauai on the beach to a two bedroom apartment in Dallas. This is what the legal, uh, costs have done to us. So, uh, and what about bank account? Oh, and bank accounts are empty. Everything is gone. All went to attorneys all to it's defend all... you for something you're innocent. Absolutely. Of, that you walked away from. That you. <laughs> that, that's only supposed to happen in movies. Right now, that's another sh sh show, maybe one day. But the reality is, at this point now, my finances are gone. More important, my reputation is gone, and I'm feeling no way out. Depression hits. But wait, you still have a beautiful wife. You have still got the ability to be a motivational speaker. Yeah. Why depression? Again, I, I can't even answer why. I can say for, mo for many men, we're defined by how well we provide. And mm. I was not providing. I was not providing. My wife never lost her sense of peace and love for me. She uh, was there. Had you ever had depression like that in your entire life? Oh, bouts, you know, but never anything I couldn't handle. I mean, mm -hmm. it was easy. This was massive. Mm -hmm. This was massive. This was heavy. And then on top of it, I reached a point where I didn't sleep for two solid weeks. My goodness. I, don't, I didn't know someone could do that. I didn't either. So now, on top of the physical depression, there's, uh, there's physical, uh, I'm a physical wreck. And uh, I don't see any way out. I literally don't see any way out, and I'm planning a thought. I'm planning actions that many men have had, I've come to discover, and I start thinking I'm worth more dead than alive. But with the case of insurance companies, I had to think, how am I going to make it look natural? That, that's so opposite what you propagated, what you taught 80,000 yeah. people in an audience. You had them on the edge of their seat. The God within. That's right. You really... Now I've come to realize I left out the key ingredient throughout all those success talks. Okay, but at so this you're... point, I didn't even see that. At this point, I'm just feeling incredible depression with no way out, literally planning, how can I make it look natural because I'm worth more dead than alive you, to my family. Do you think your wife realized what was going on? Oh, she realized, you? she realized, and she prayed and was nothing but supportive, which actually at times made me even angrier. And I'll tell you what really made me angry at what? this point. She was completely at peace completely happy, knew things would work out. But, but she lost all we lost that everything. beautiful home. And... and she was fine about it, which really upset me even more. Had she shown a reaction, I can't believe you did this. Maybe, I, I don't know. But she never, she just pure love. All, all your abilities, you couldn't get out of this mess with the federal government? No. There was, oh, absolutely not. All right, what was the potential prognosis? For what would have happened to you? Well, uh, two things. First of all, the lawsuit was for $85 million. 
$85 million? $85 million lawsuit. It's against many defendants, and it's still going on against most of them, almost all of them but me. We'll get to that later. Could you have gotten jail time? No, it was not a criminal case. Mm -hmm. It was a civil case. But $85 million is, is enough to affect you the rest of your life. There's a lot of shekels. <laughs> Absolutely. So you're depressed. You're suicidal. I am, uh, I am suicidal. You're, do you have the insurance policy? Have the insurance policy, but I have to make it look natural. Do you know? Because you can't collect. The family can't collect if it's a suicide. So, so I have that thought. I'm th starting to think creatively. How do I make it look natural? Because I, I, I know that I'm worth more dead than alive at this point. And my wife is comforting me, hugging me, doing nothing. Aren't you a little me. afraid of dying? I was more afraid of living at that I'll point. I'll tell you what. Hold that thought. We'll be back right after this, and we'll find out what happened with this $85 million lawsuit. We'll be right back. Before we get to Peter Hirsch and that $85 million lawsuit, let's find out who's up next week. Janie? Sid, you'll be speaking to a man by the name of Art Mathias who has seen hundreds of people healed of all kinds of diseases when he would find the emotional root, the emotional pain that caused that disease. He was nearly dead himself from environmental illness, but then when he found out what the emotional pains were, he was totally healed and he had been allergic to a hundred different things. You know, a lot of people don't realize that the emotions, literally, when they're corrected, the body takes care of itself and all these dread diseases disappear. And what's really amazing is that he has found, for instance, when women have women problems, uh, they found that a lot of times it's because of a pain or a hurt from their mother or their sisters. It's really amazing. Thank you, Janie. I'm here in the studio now with Peter Hirsch. And Peter is a Jewish man trained in yeshivas, uh, trained in Israel, uh, an attorney, a successful businessman that challenged Jesus. He says, don't give Jesus credit, give me credit. And his whole world fell apart. He got involved in an $85 million lawsuit. He lost everything. Uh, he went from a, a beautiful house overlooking the ocean in Hawaii uh, to a small apartment in Dallas, Texas. And uh, so you're, you're losing everything. Now you're yeah. thinking about committing suicide yeah. and how you can do it. And your wife still gets the life insurance. Absolutely. What happened next? Well, and then it was, I reached a beautiful day. I reached a day of total and complete desperation where I knew if I didn't sleep this night, the next morning, it was over. How long had you gone without it, sleeping? This is two weeks. It's two weeks without sleep. Mm -hmm. And physically I'm a wreck, emotionally I'm a wreck. I don't know what caused me to do this, except for my wife and her family's three years of constant prayer for me. But before bed, I got down on my knees for the first time in my life. Wait a second. A Jew doesn't get down on their knees. I mean, we do the opposite of what Christians do. If Christians right. get on their knees, we don't. Right. Uh, right. Why did you? I had no way out. And I, I, Judaism was, is who I am, it's what, but it, I needed something more. I, I, it was an act of desperation. It was an act of desperation. So I got on my knees, and I said the words I remember so clearly. I said, Jesus... If you're real, now's the time to show me, because there's not going to be a tomorrow if you don't tell me right now, and you don't show me. <laughs> the miracle that happened wasn't just that I slept through the night, which was a miracle. You did sleep I, through the oh, entire night. I slept night. like a baby. But the real miracle is that I woke up in the morning with a sense of peace that I had never felt before in my life, knowing beyond doubt that everything was going to be fine. And my life from that moment on was no longer my own. From it's, that moment on. It's very different than what you used to believe. Ah, oh, it's dramatically, it's so different that I actually had to stop selling that first book that I wrote because it's just, it's not what I believe anymore. But a rabbi would say, you just had an emotional experience right. and now come home to Orthodox Judaism. What would you say? 
you know, there's a difference between an emotional experience and the knowing. This was a simple knowing. This was an absolute knowing that my life is no longer my own, that Jesus picked me up from right when, when I was ready to fall and go to the lowest possible depths, he came in and saved me. What about that $85 million lawsuit? <laughs> this was beautiful. About uh, six weeks ago, maybe eight weeks ago, was my deposition from the Federal Trade Commission. So I'm there. It's eight hours where they're questioning me. At the end of the deposition, by the way, I uh, asked the lawyers if they had a few minutes, and I shared with them the positive things that have come out of this lawsuit. Well, a week later, I get a call from my attorney, a surprising call. The Federal Trade Commission is willing to settle with me for zero dollars. I remember when I got the call, because I was in the Phoenix airport, I had just come out of a meeting with Tommy Barnett, a wonderful, wonderful man of God. And right when I came out of that meeting, I'm in the airport, flying back to De Texas, I get this call. And if I wasn't surrounded by all these people in that busy airport, I would have prostrated myself right on the ground at that airport. I felt so thankful, but so much more than thankful, so humbled to, to be the, the object of a direct supernatural miracle. You have no doubt. Th there's no room for doubt. See, if it was a token fine, which is normally the case right. when somebody doesn't have money, a token $25,000, $50,000 in an $85 million lawsuit, there would have been room for doubt. When the fine is zero, there's no room for doubt. What is the difference between what you, it was almost a religion. Yeah. Is it fair to say a, a religion of self, oh. a religion of uh, positive thinking? It was the religion of positive thinking. What Absolutely. Is, what, what is the difference now? Very simple. Faith is not positive thinking because faith focuses clearly on God's supernatural, incredible ability to deal with your current situation beyond question. Positive thinking doesn't do that. Positive thinking can be delusional. You know, I always felt positive thinking was wonderful until you bump into your first crisis. <laughs> and then it's not so wonderful. But I'll tell you something about our God. God says all things are possible to those who believe. And that's what Peter is saying right now. Peter is saying that he's no longer reliant on himself because self will fail and disappoint. He's reliant on God. He gives God credit. He trusts God in the impossible. But in order to trust God, you have to know him. And in order to know him, you have to have your sins forgiven. And in order to have your sins forgiven, there is no other name given unto men in which we must have our sins atoned for. My father used to tell me in Poland, his father, my grandfather, would, would take a chicken and break its neck and wave it over his head and say, this blood pays for my sin. But you see, it didn't. It's only the blood of an unblemished lamb in the temple, and that pointed to the Passover lamb of God, Yeshua. That's Hebrew for Jesus. There's no other name given unto men in which we must be saved. And the Torah says, without the shedding of blood, there is no atonement for sin. I have given the blood onto the altar as atonement for your sin. It's the blood of Yeshua who came to wash away all of your sins to the point where God says, I'll remember them no more. And when you repent of your sins and believe that Yeshua washed them away and asked Yeshua to live inside of you, you become in right relationship with God and he will be your best friend. A friend that is there always for you, not sometimes, that loves you no matter what happens in your life. He's just pouring his love through me right now. He is pouring his love. The love of God is going right into you. It's going into your every fiber of your being. That's true shalom. 
That's true love. It's not religion, not Judaism, Christianity. It's relationship.